Uh, so hi, like you said, my name is Erin. I'm in the nuclear group. I do nuclear astrophysics. And tonight I'm going to talk to you about Shabelsky's star, which is one of the most mysterious stars in the universe. And as of 2018, uh, is going on 58 years of being an enigma and a mystery. Uh, so to set the scene, in 1960, we're in Canberra, Australia. And this man, oh, <laughs> I'm bad at pointers. I don't use them very often. Uh, this man right here, who's looking pretty awkward, is Antony Shabilsky. Uh, he's a Polish astronomer, and looking at stars is what he does. So he travels to Canberra, Australia, to the Mount Stromlo Observatory 74-inch telescope, and he starts observing stars. Um, so basically, he puffs out his eyeball really large and looks in this telescope here. Uh, and basically, this is how telescopes work. No. <laughs> um, so basically, he's checking out the Centaurus constellation, and he's looking, and he uh, is looking around, and he sees something pretty mysterious. He's looking, and he's like, what? what's going on here? I don't really get this. So what he's looking at is a spectra. And a spectrum is basically this diagram here. We're looking at flux, which is basically the amount of light, uh, versus wavelength, which is on this axis or axis, and the wavelength is basically, um, we look at that because it tells us what kind of light we're looking at. So you can look at UV light, x-rays, visible light, and that's basically, each wavelength corresponds to a different type of light. So Shabelsky's looking in the visible range, and what he sees are peaks like this. And these peaks are called absorption features, and basically you see an absorption feature when there is something in the star, specifically a type of element, that is absorbing the light at a certain wavelength. And different elements absorb light at specific wavelengths due to quantum mechanics. And I'm not going to get into it because you'll all fall asleep. But anyway, um, these absorption features correspond to different wavelengths of visible light. And they match up to the visible spectra like this. So here we're seeing the absorption features for hydrogen. Um, and we know this because we've looked at hydrogen in the lab and we see that it absorbs at these different frequencies. So Shavilsky's looking at his star and he's looking at a different, uh, different spectrum from this and he's like, this is really weird. Um, he ended up publishing a paper on this star which is called HD 10165, but in the years since has been come, to know, come to be known as Shavilsky's star. And it's come to be known as that because people can't figure out what's going on. There's been almost 80 publications or more since 1961 when he first published this star. Oops. So you might be wondering, why are people publishing things about this star? I mean, obviously it's interesting. I'm giving a talk on it at this Astro and Tap event. But what's going on? And to kind of explain that to you, I'm going to go through... Uh, a little bit what the star is about, like some features of the star. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is that Shabilsky's star is a ROAP star. And ROAP is just an acronym. Uh, and I'm going to go through one by one to try to tell you a little bit about it. So the RO in ROAP star means rapidly oscillating. And if you look at this plot here, it's brightness of the star versus the time. And basically you can see that it is changing quickly. Uh, so quickly, in fact, that it's changing every 12 and a half minutes. The star is getting brighter and dimming and getting brighter again. Uh, this was actually discovered almost 18 years after Shabilsky actually originally observed this star. Uh, and that was discovered by D.W. Kurtz in 78 in South Africa uh, on a follow-up to see more about this star. And basically, this was also the first ROAP star discovered. So that's kind of cool, right? I don't know. I don't know much about stars, but... <laughs> okay, um, moving on. The star is also spectral type A. Uh, and stars have different spectral types, but really what matters here are two different things. So the first one is that this star is, conveys heat with radiation. And when I say that, I mean uh, stars convey heat with two main types. Convection, which means a moving of the material, the star, kind of like the water boiling in this pot or radiation, where the energy is transferred directly to the thing it's heating up. And that's what's going on here. And this is important because that means the material in the star isn't mixing up and moving around. It's kind of just staying where it is. And that's going to come up a little bit later. 
The second interesting thing is that these stars typically have a very fast rotation, but AP stars are a little different. When stars are born, especially A stars and other hot stars, they are a cloud of gas that slowly spins together, and then when it gets dense enough, it starts burning and becoming a star. Well, here in AP stars, uh, there is a magnetic field, and it's very strong, and those magnetic fields slow down the rotation of the star, so that by the time the star is born, the star is not really rotating fast, if at all. So that's kind of cool because if you have a star that's not rotating really quickly, that means it's much easier to see what the spectrum looks like, which is that first picture I showed you. So it's pretty easy for them to identify what they're looking at in the star. Um, if the star was spinning, you'd have to figure out the lines move because the star is spinning and it gets a little complicated and it's less work this way. So the last part of Rho Ap star means it's chemically peculiar. And what I mean here is that the elements in the star are a little different from what we're used to. So in this graph here, you see these open circles, which are uh, different elements in the sun. We're plotting the element, which is plotted by atomic number here, versus the amount in some weird units that we don't really need to care about. But up is more. I'm sure we all guessed that. <laughs> Um, so we have the sun in these open circles and the different elements in Shabilsky's star in these closed circles. And it doesn't take a genius to see that these are really different. Weird stuff's going on. So when we look at Shabilsky's star versus beta CRB, which is another row up star, we see that Shabilsky's star is still really weird. Beta CRB is in this dotted spectrum. This is another absorption spectrum kind of zoomed in. Uh, and with a lot more lines than that first one I showed you. And Shabilsky's star is here in the black. And you can see these peaks are really different. They're at totally different amounts, and they don't match up at all. And that's interesting because Shabilsky's star is very, very peculiar. Uh, it's really weird even for an AP star. And that's part of why it's really interesting. So in 2000, in the 2000s, uh, various people went back and they looked at the spectrum of this star because uh, techniques and instruments had advanced since then, which obviously has been like 45 years. But in 2004, a man named Crowley identified Promethium, Neodymium, and Praseodymium, which are weird, heavy elements. It doesn't matter too much. Um, and in 2008, Gopka identified a whole bunch of these elements, which are also known as actinides, on the periodic table. And you can see some of the features here in these spectra. They kind of didn't show up well, but it doesn't really matter. Just trust me. I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> um, so, okay, yeah, there's these weird elements of the star. Why should you care, right? Um, the reason these are so interesting is because they are very short-lived. So here I'm showing you the periodic table. I'm sure you've all probably seen this before in some form or another. Um, but here we're showing the shortest lived or the longest lived isotope of each element. So an element is made up of electrons surrounding a nucleus of protons and neutrons. And when I say isotope, I mean the number of protons establishes what element you are, and the number of neutrons establishes what isotope. So you can be looking at aluminum, it has a set number of protons. And then you can be looking at any different variety of isotopes with any different number of neutrons. So that's basically what I mean here. So the longest lived isotope of each element is shown here and it ranges from totally stable to like only a few minutes in purple. You really don't wanna be around those, you'll probably die. Um, so here I've shown a box of some of the elements we see in Shabilsky star. And you'll notice that some of these boxes are surrounding the orange color which corresponds to a half-life, which means the element takes this long to decay to half of, much, ha half of how much you started with. It takes 103 years to decay. Shabilsky's star is somewhere on the order of 50 million years old. So for an element with a half-life of only 103 years to be there, something has to actually be in the star actively creating this element or putting the element there externally. And this is why people think Shabilsky's star is really interesting. We haven't been able to explain why or how these elements have appeared in the star. 
So I'm going to talk to you about the three ideas, I think they're the only three ideas, uh, that have, people have come up with to explain this. The first one was the most plausible explanation, however it didn't end up working. So basically what was proposed is that Shabilsky's star would be very close to a neutron star. And a neutron star is a really dense star. Uh, and it has special properties, but I'm not going to get into that right now. So basically, what would be happening here is that Shabilsky's star would be right next to this neutron star, and the neutron star would be creating this hot plasma and blowing it onto Shabilsky's star. And what this does is it would create a bunch of free neutrons so that the neutrons would interact with the stuff in Shabilsky's star and create other new elements. And this we see a lot in nature in something called the R process. It creates short-lived elements like this. So people were like, oh, this is a really good idea. Uh, this guy, Gopka, who also found some of those elements uh, in 2008, proposed this as an idea to kind of like explain where these short-lived isotopes that he was seeing were coming from. Because that's a little weird. And people were probably like, did you make a mistake? What's going on, dude? So. He came up with this, and it, it was a good idea for four years until this guy, Scholler, investigated what's really going on. What's, is there a binary? Is there a star next to Shabilsky's star? And the answer is no. Uh, Scholler did a really in-depth investigation, and he discovered there's nothing within 1,000 astronomical units of Shabilsky's star. There's nothing there. This isn't going to work. So what else do we have left? Well, the next interesting idea that was proposed was in 2017, this Russian physicist, Dutsuba. Um, I guess that's how you say his name. I don't know. But anyway, uh, he proposed that there was a, a decay of super heavy elements that would create these short-lived nuclei. And basically how this works is that you get a heavy element that has a long half-life on the order of a couple million years, uh, something like uranium-238, like in this picture. And this element's around for a long time, but it's constantly decaying and creating these isotopes in a characteristic decay chain. So we know what they are. Um, and there's signatures of these shorter-lived isotopes there. But you know where they're coming from. They're coming from this longer-lived isotope that we know about. Well, the difference here is that Dutsuba proposed that these super-heavy elements are elements we haven't seen yet. So, OK. Um, and this idea, it works. There's some spectral lines that we haven't been able to match up to elements, meaning they could be from these super heavy elements. All right. Uh, this is a pretty interesting idea to nuclear physicists like me and the people I work with, um, because it basically adds things on to our periodic table, which is called the trite of the nuclides. And it's this big strip of rancid looking bacon right here. Um, <laughs> the proton number goes up and the neutron number goes across. So basically you're getting the elements up and the isotopes across. And this rancid fat strip in the middle is the stable nuclei. And then the lighter colors you get go to shorter half-lives. So basically here, um, if this super heavy element decay were to be correct, we'd be seeing elements here, which you will notice are not here. We haven't observed these elements yet, which is kind of cool. If Dutsuba's idea is right, then we'll be observing super heavy elements that we haven't seen yet for the first time in the wild. This is really interesting to nuclear physicists like us. But hey, there's one more option if this isn't right. That would be external influence on Shabilsky's star. And by external influence, yeah, I mean aliens. <laughs> So don't be a skeptic just yet. I'm going to explain what I mean. Um, in the 1960s, this man, uh, Yosef Shklovsky, a uh, Ukrainian astrophysicist, uh, and this man, Raymond Drake, a UFOologist, independently proposed the idea that alien civilizations would be salting their stars. And basically, <laughs> how they would be doing this is just like Salt Bay. Just kidding. They would be, <laughs> um, they would be sending these short-lived isotopes that we can't explain for having a presence in this star onto Shabilsky's star to be like, hey, world, we're here. 
come look for us. Um, and I, I thought this idea was really interesting because I know I don't know about you, but when I hear about aliens, I only ever think about like, oh, we're sending like some slow spacecraft that's going to make it in like eight billion years to somebody, or we're sending out radio waves or something. And this is a totally different idea for sending out a beacon saying we're here. Uh, and before you get too skeptical, uh, Carl Sagan and Shaklovsky talked about this idea extensively in their book, Intelligent Life in the Universe, which was published in 1960s, 1966. Sorry. Um, so, I mean, hey, it's a cool idea. But that's not the only way that aliens could be involved. Uh, the second idea is what I like to call the giant trash can hypothesis. And basically, uh, in the 1980s, these dudes, Whitmire and Wright, who, interestingly enough, were at University of Louisiana Lafayette at the time, proposed that alien civilizations might use their home suns, or stars, as dumping grounds for nuclear waste. And before you just, like, get ready to leave because this is stupid, you should know that NASA and our government considered this idea quite extensively for a while in the 70s and 80s. <laughs> and considering we don't have an actual good method of disposing of nuclear waste, uh, I wouldn't rule it out just yet. So Whitmire and Wright wrote an interesting paper talking about which stars we'd be able to see this nuclear waste on the best. Uh, and so basically they would have the following four qualities. Uh, they would be spectral type A5 through F2 stars, meaning these are hot radiative stars. And remember, like I mentioned, radiative stars do not mix up material. So any waste dumped in wouldn't get lost somewhere else in the, the depths of the star, unable to be seen. Um, additionally, they would have a really high abundance that's kind of inexplicable of praseodymium and neodymium. They would have any presence at all of technetium or plutonium. And they would have a really weird high ratio of barium over zirconium. So with Shabilsky star, if we look at these uh, candidates, or these qualities for candidates, it is in fact a spectral type A star, like I told you. Uh, in the 2000s, we discovered that, yes, it does have a really weirdly high amount of praseodymium and neodymium with very strong presence. Um, it does have plutonium. We haven't seen technetium, but it could be that it's there and we just don't know the spectral lines. There's some science hidden in there, if you're curious. And then for this last one, we haven't looked at it, but we haven't ruled it out. So this is a pretty plausible thing. I mean, we've used a bunch of other natural resources as trash cans, so why not the sun? <laughs> anyway, so there's two main ideas that are a little weird. Uh, that could explain why Shabilsky star has these weird elements present. But really, I know what we're all thinking. It's aliens. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but only sort of. Uh, aliens are a pretty good idea. There's no real reason to rule them out. We don't have any much better ideas. Um, except for this other one with super heavy elements. And that's a really cool idea. Uh, that would signify that we're seeing super heavy elements that we are unable to create in a lab in the stars. Uh, and that's really awesome. We can't actually create them in the lab because of nuclear physics constraints, but maybe one day we'll get there and we'll be able to figure out, hey, it is super heavy elements, or no, it's not, it's definitely aliens. Uh, but anyway, uh, I hope that you have discovered that this is a really mysterious star in a different way that maybe you haven't heard of because it's been buried by long amounts of time and no social media coverage. <laughs> Oops. Um, but if you want to learn more about this and get more in depth into the science and reasoning behind this, two really awesome resources are Jason Wright's blog, Astro Wright, which is where I first discovered this when I was like, I have to write a talk for astrophysics seminar. What am I going to do? Um, so he wrote a really cool three-part series on this. Uh, and the other really interesting page is Shabilsky's Most Unusual Star by Cowley, who is one of the guys who's extensively studied the spectra of this star. So anyway, I hope you think this is a really awesome star, and thanks for listening to me blather on for 20 minutes.
All right, fantastic. That's a wonderful talk. I think Jabil CCR definitely has some, some ground on Tabby stars, the weirdest star in the galaxy. So tell me, how exactly did you learn how to say Jabilski? Uh, yeah, I did really extensive blog post research and also delving deep into Polish pronunciation. Uh, it was a weird time. <laughs> I agree. It's too many, too many consonants to make those sounds. Anyway, uh, at this time, we would like to uh, welcome the questions from the audience. Um, so, I mean, I guess there might be dust. I'm not an astronomer by trade, so I'm not 100% sure. But any, like, visible stars that we could see, they were able to do a really good... So, because Chabilsky's star has these special features of it not rotating very quickly, et cetera, et cetera, um, they were able to pretty firmly determine that there's nothing of any large matter that would be able to cause this type of situation at the very least. I can't rule out that there's other small things, though. Yeah? What's the reasoning for the qualifications that were developed for a star that would be a dumping ground? Oh, yeah, I did forget to mention that. Uh, the qualifications for a star that would be a dumping ground uh, that Whitmire and Wright discussed, uh, they wrote a whole paper on this. So the first one, the spectral type, I think I did explain that it would be because the waste wouldn't go into the star. But the last three, they spent some time studying uh, radioactive waste on Earth and uh, extrapolating what would happen to that waste when dumped into a star over periods of time and what elements would become highly uh, abundant compared to other ones. It's actually a really interesting paper. We have it in the LSU library in some weird journal called Icarus, if you're interested. <laughs> I was the first one to check out Icarus in like 50 years. Um, I'm not 100% sure what you mean by that, what generation star it is. So how far it is through the cycle of star birth? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so they've had a little bit of trouble determining the temperature of the star, which is a little important for that. Um, and that's, I didn't go into this in detail, but there's, um, because of the magnetic fields and the lack of spinning, there's this effect called blanketing going on, where the uh, elements are stratifying in different layers. So it makes it, one, really hard to determine the temperature, and two, really hard to determine, like, which abundances of what there are. Like, they're there, an element, but they don't know, like, how it is relative because of that layering. So it's a little complicated, and I also don't know off the top of my head. But there's some really interesting stuff if you're looking into it. I highly recommend looking into it. It's really interesting. Okay, uh, so if we took all the nuclear waste on our Earth and dumped it into our star, would it be enough to have this effect? So part of the reason we couldn't do that is, one, I don't think we've created enough waste yet. I, they discussed this in the paper. It's pretty interesting if you want to steal the book off my desk. Um, <laughs> but also, because we have a convective star, there's something to do with that that would make it not work as well. Um, but they did also constrain it by, like, lifetime of the civilization, Interestingly enough, though, they also proposed that, like, you could, if you were, like, not trying to be cost economical, you could send it to a close-by star, so, I don't know. There's some interesting stuff going on. I highly recommend checking out this article, because I don't remember all of it exactly. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, so does it have a neighbor close enough to be that? Um, I don't actually know. I know there are no stars at all within 1,000 AU, so that's kind of hard. But um, as for, like, planets and stuff around Shabilsky's star, which they also proposed, um, I don't know if they've been able to identify any. I'm not really sure. Um, Let's see. I hope I will not deafen people with this thing. I'll try and do my best with this. So I'm Rob Hines. I'm one of the astronomers at LSU. I'm sitting staring at a really bright light and a little intimidated by it, so I will try not to be put off by it. What I'm going to talk about is x-rays. I will tell you a bit about what this picture is. X-rays have some pretty pictures. I probably got a bit carried away over pretty pictures in this talk. I may get carried away over timing if they have to drag me off. Okay. Let me talk about x-rays. If I can ever do anything... We're off to a great start here. Yes, okay, good. So, Erin um, talked a bit about spectra earlier, and she said, showed you that spectrum going from red through to blue. There's a whole lot more to the spectrum than that bit. What she showed you was this tiny little bit here. What I'm going to talk about is the rest of it, or a little bit of the rest of it. Because beyond the visible light, the red through the blue, you can see other colors as infrared and ultraviolet, all the way through to x-rays, gamma rays, radio. What I'm going to talk about is the stuff beyond the visible, beyond the ultraviolet. We're going to talk about x-rays. Not mysterious stuff, real stuff, nothing weird, just, just light, just really, 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 really blue light. So a little bit of history to start off with. Oops take you back to around the time that Sputnik launched, around the time that NASA formed, coming up on a 60th anniversary, around the time that US decided we got to do something, we got to catch up. One of the things that people are thinking at the time is, what could we do in space? If we're going to go into space, could we do some cool stuff? And so a group of people, Ricardo Giacconi, Bruno Rossi, were thinking, hey, maybe we could do something with x-rays. Because one of the things about x-rays is there's not a lot of this spectrum that goes through the atmosphere. This is colored by how it goes through the atmosphere. If it's white, it goes through. We can see visible light. We can use radios. Your cell phones will be in trouble without them. We can't do x-ray or ultraviolet or gamma ray astronomy from the ground. So until you can go into space, you're kind of stuck. At the time, the biggest problem was they didn't actually know why they would do astronomy in space. They did some calculations. We kind of knew, yeah, the sun is bright in x-rays. We can see the sun. Can we see anything else? Well, not really. They did some calculations. They tried to convince NASA. NASA told them to go away because they didn't really have anything they could see. Rossi's argument was probably the best argument for it. Every time people have gone and looked where they haven't looked before, they found something new and exciting. They tried that on NASA, it didn't work. It's what people who review proposals call a fishing expedition. We want to go and see what's on the other side of a hill because nobody's gone there before. Give us lots of money. No. So then they went to plan B. They tried coming up with some other, some other idea, some other way to justify it. What they came up with, these are the exact words that Ricardo Giacconi used at a conference a few years ago. Quotes are intentional. We cooked up a moon experiment. The way they did this is they did some calculations and said, you know, when x-rays from the sun hit the moon, they're going to cause the surface of the moon to fluoresce. Some of the solar wind will hit the moon and produce x-rays. If we study those x-rays, we can learn about the surface of the moon. Hey, Air Force guys, you want to go to the moon? Wouldn't you like to know about the moon's surface? And the Air Force said, sure, here, have some money. And so X-ray astronomy began with Air Force funding because they promised they could learn about the moon. It also began with these two guys and an aerobie rocket. What they did was they launched this rocket. It went above the atmosphere for a whopping 90 seconds, span around a bit, and then crashed. But in that 90 seconds, they actually got to observe x-rays from space. And they actually succeeded. What they saw looked like this. So this is a really, really, really not high-resolution map of the sky. The rocket shot up 
for about 90 seconds. It span around. As it spanned around, its highly sophisticated Geiger counter swung across the sky. As it did, it said, how many x-rays do we detect from different directions? What they found was when you looked in a certain direction, you saw something. There was a big bright thing, kind of this away. Give or take a few tens of degrees. It's kind of up there somewhere. What they did see, though, it's not where you expected the moon to be. It's over here, not here. It's not where the Earth's magnetic field should be. It's something else. And so they called it bright X-ray source in the direction vaguely of Scorpius, or shorthand Scorpius XR1, or as it's now known, Scorpius X1. Turned out what they found was really, really cool. What they found was a binary star, and the binary star has a normal star and a tiny little neutron star. Erin mentioned neutron stars earlier. They're about 10, 15 kilometers in radius, tiny things. You could put one in Baton Rouge, and it wouldn't even reach the edges. Tiny things, but they have more than the mass of the sun, all compressed down into a tiny space. And then some of the gas from this star kind of overflows the star, falls into an accretion disk around this neutron star. As it falls in, it gets hotter and hotter. It glows in visible light. It grows in ultraviolet. Eventually, it gets so hot, millions of degrees, that it glows in x-rays. And that's what they saw. And it turns out Scorpius X1 is one of the brightest things in the sky in x-rays. It turns out we know a whole load more of these things now. Some of them have neutron stars. Some of them have black holes. These are the things that I study. Most of this talk is not about what I do, but this slide is kind of what I do. These are my things, my friends, my buddies. So that's one of the things that I saw, Scorpius X1. What else can you do with extra astronomy? Because what they effectively did is they created a new kind of astronomy. And as often happens when you discover something really big and new, there's this really excited response from a community and you get a Nobel Prize right away, right? The LIGO people know all about that. So, Riccardo Giacconi did all of this back in 1962. That's what he looked like then. This is what he looked like when he got his Nobel Prize. You might notice he looks a little bit older. He had to wait 40 years for his Nobel Prize. The secret to Nobel Prizes, discover things early and then live a healthy life, get your exercise, eat your vegetables. You've got to stay alive because you might have to wait 40 years for it. Does anyone here read Swedish? Okay, good. Nobody's going to criticize my translation. Supposedly, his Nobel Prize here says, for pioneering contributions to astrophysics, which have led to the discovery of cosmic X-ray sources. I've never yet had somebody speak Swedish who's told me that's not what it says. He discovered a new field of astronomy, X-rays. It just took a long time to actually get to do anything with it. But they did. Nowadays, things have got a little bit more sophisticated. A modern X-ray satellite is not a rocket that shoots above the atmosphere for 90 seconds and crashes. They're big multi-million to multi-pushing billion dollar projects. They aren't developed within the space of a year or two like Giacconi's rocket mission was. He went from 1960 coming up with the idea to 1962 publishing his results. These things take decades, careers, scary amounts of time. This, book, this one is called the Chandra X-ray Observatory. It was launched in the year 2000. It was proposed by Giacconi in 1975. Long, long time. So big, expensive X-ray satellites are how we do it now. And what you get is you get a whole lot better than big, fuzzy thing in the direction of Scorpius. What you get is you get pretty images like this. This is what's called a supernova remnant. This is one called Cassiopeia A. It's a remnant of when a star dies, the core of the star collapses, some weird stuff happens, and ask Dr. Hatsopoulos about that if you want to know about supernovae. And it explodes. 
and the exploding stuff flies outward through space, and that's what you're seeing here. We know it's exploding, and we know it's expanding outwards, because when you look at this with this Chandra X-ray observatory, this is what we saw in the year 2000. This is what we saw in the year 2007. You can see it getting bigger, which is great, because you can see it expand. You can measure back, when did this happen? Turns out it happened about 300 years ago. Cassiopeia, northern constellation, right? Many people might have even seen that in the sky. 300 years ago. There were scientists 300 years ago. Nobody saw it. Nobody saw this one. Somehow it got missed. Another neat, well, a couple of other neat things that you can do with these pictures. First thing, you can see this little dot in the middle. That's another one of those neutron stars. They keep up cropping up again and again. Neutron stars and black holes kind of pervade this talk. It's what I work on. I apologize. Um, there's a neutron star. The other thing is there's pretty colors. The pretty colors here are not just to make it pretty, although that's kind of important. The pretty colors are to tell you about different kinds of emission lines, but they actually translate to different chemical elements. And so just like Aaron was telling you about how you can use absorption lines in stars to study what the chemical composition was, you can use the emission lines here to probe what happened in the last part of a star's lifetime and what got thrown off into space. You can learn about where many of the heavy elements come from in supernovae. So these color pictures are not just pretty. They actually contain a lot of science. Here's another one. This one we fortunately did see. Back in the 11th century, Chinese astronomers saw this one. They called it a guest star. It was a new bright star in the sky. And over a 1,000 years, it gradually faded away and left behind this nebula. It's called the Crab Nebula. It's one of the brightest, most accessible of these supernova remnants, the small telescopes. It also has a small pulse, a small neutron star in the middle. This neutron star is a bit different. This is a very cold neutron star. You can kind of see its effects here because there's this bluish glow. The bluish glow doesn't look that weird in visible light. But actually, it looks a whole lot better if you go to x-rays. You can't see x-rays, but with a right telescope, Got to get one in there somewhere. With a right telescope, you can see weird, weird stuff. That's what the blue light looks like. You can see there's a pulsar in the middle. You can see these two jets coming off. You can see these kind of waves, ripples going out through this disk. Weird stuff. Little shout out about pulsars. Crab pulsar is one of many of these neutron stars that have funky pulsations. These were first discovered uh, 51 years ago by Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell. 40 years is not the limit of how long you may have to wait. Jocelyn Bell, great lady, wonderful lady. I got to meet her one a few times. She discovered pulsars in 1967 when she was a graduate student over here. 1974, she did not win a Nobel Prize. She is probably one of the most famous people who did not win a Nobel Prize. Her graduate advisor got a Nobel Prize. This has been a source of some controversy. However, she has done very well. The dame is a very significant thing if you live in England. Not many people get to be dames. Um, she's been very successful. And finally, last week, she was awarded the special breakthrough prize for discovering pulsars. 51 years ago. Big shout out for Jocelyn. Little known fact, this is way better than a Nobel Prize. It's worth more than twice as much money. But because she's been so successful and is such an awesome lady, she gave it all away to charities that work with helping underrepresented and disadvantaged women get success in the sciences. So very generous lady as well. But not primarily an extra astronomer, but it seemed topical to digress. So back to x-rays. What else can you do with x-rays? This is a view of the center of our own galaxy, taken in x-rays. You do get some very pretty pictures. There's all sorts of stuff down here. 
These two bright kind of bluish greenish things are extra binaries like Scorpius X1, possibly black holes. There are some supernova remnants over here. There's some other ones. There's one down in Sagittarius A. Sagittarius A itself, well, mostly that's famous because there's a black hole down there. It's about four million solar masses. Little thing. As supermassive black holes go, it's a little one. But still, it's ours and it's special. We love it very much. <laughs> there are these things, kind of unremarkable, called Sagittarius B1 and B2 and C. Those are clouds of gas and dust. They're kind of noteworthy because if you look at the x-rays from those, you can actually see echoes from the 19th century. You can see when the black hole in Sagittarius A used to be one of the brightest things in the x-ray sky a few hundred years ago. It isn't anymore. It's incredibly faint now. But a few hundred years ago, it was one of the brightest things in the x-ray sky. We have a little active galactic nucleus in our own galaxy. So lots of cool stuff going on in the galactic center. Very busy place, very confusing place. Scientists are still trying to understand it. Uh, moving outwards from our own galaxy, this is not an X-ray picture. This is a visible light picture. This is what's called a ring galaxy. Ring galaxies are cool. Ring galaxies are what you take, what you get. And I really can't wave my arms very well here, and it's kind of awkward. Ring galaxies are what you get if you take an ordinary galaxy and a little galaxy, and you shoot your little galaxy through the middle of a big galaxy. Right? Like throwing stones into a pond, but way, way bigger. When a little galaxy goes through a big galaxy, it sends out a kind of expanding ring of ripples. That's what you see here. And all along that expanding ring, you're forming stars. That's why it's so bright and blue. There's masses and masses of stars being formed in that ring. It turns out when you form new young stars, you also get other core things going on like these X-ray binaries again and supernova remnants again. So when you look in X-rays, this is what you see. You actually see a ring of these X-ray sources, those purple things, that go around that ring. If you put them on top of each other, purple things mostly line up. You can kind of see where they line up. So, X-ray telescopes are also great for studying other galaxies. And one of the big things in modern astronomy with this Chandra X-ray Observatory I showed you before is being able to make pictures like this. As good as many visible light telescopes do, is sharp. But let us see individual stars in these galaxies sometimes. Well, let's see. Uh, let's go back, back, back to where we began. We talked about that whole fishing expedition and how there was some possible force advertising. When they sold the Air Force on how, yeah, we're going to learn about the moon, which turned out to be learning about neutron stars far away. Turns out you can see what they were looking for. It just wasn't as bright as they expected. You can see the moon in x-rays. This is an x-ray image of a moon taken in 1990, took a much more sensitive telescope. There's something really cool about this image. What's really cool is not the bright part of a moon, what they were looking for. What's cool is the darkest part of this image. Do you see the dark side of a moon? You can see the dark side of a moon in x-rays. The dark side of a moon is darker than the sky. That means the x-ray sky you're seeing is behind the moon, not in front of it. These little dots are probably coming from little particles high up in the Earth's magnetic fields. The stuff beyond the moon is coming from far, far further away. The whole sky is lit up by a background of x-rays. And it's weirder than those, far weirder than those Air Force people imagined when they funded Giacconi. We've got a much better idea of what that is now. Thanks in part again to Giacconi, he just keeps coming back. Um, this is him. <laughs> so one of the things that he did with this Chandra X-ray Observatory was they put a project together to do something spectacularly dumb, at least on face value. 
It's something that many big telescopes like Chandra and Hubble have done. Let's take our big multi-million, multi-billion dollar telescope and point it at nothing for a really long time. Let's see what nothing looks like. It's what's called the deep fields. Hubble did one first, then many of the other observatories have copied. This is the Chandra deep field. This is taking a really empty region of the sky and pointing at it for a very long time. This is about 7 million seconds of time, which is a lot of time. Start counting, and when you get to 7 million, you know how long it's been. 7 million seconds. What they see is hundreds pushing on, I think, a 1,000 now, little bright sources of x-rays. They're not stars. They're not supernova remnants. They're not x-ray binaries. Every one of those, or almost every one of those, is a gigantic black hole. What we see when we look at the moon is we see a shadow cast on that background, and a lot of our background is made up of x-rays coming from near black holes, things called quasars and active galaxies, where you have a supermassive black hole surrounded by a disk of gas and maybe a big torus of dust, squirting out jets at almost the speed of light, and these produce x-rays. And many of those background sources, many, many of them covering the area of a full moon. This image is a fraction of the size of a full moon. Just a tiny bit of a sky like that is filled with light from many, many, many supermassive black holes. That's what we see when we look deep in the universe in x-rays. That's probably a good place to finish because Tyler's waving at me. Hi. I've got five, really? Okay, what else should we talk about? <laughs> Let's see, uh, what else do I have? Uh, I put a few extra slides together just to follow up on some stuff. I, it says 825, I guess I started late. So I talked a bit about supernova remnants earlier, just to kind of fill in a bit about that. Kind of following up on Erin's talk. Ah. So you see all these different colors. Each of those colors is a different chemical element. This is probably the best one. What we see there is it's actually really, really complicated. If you take Astronomy 1102, they probably tell you about supernovas, these big spheres of gas expanding outwards. Has anyone been told that? Like a big shell. It's not a big shell. It's a mess. It's a tangled, jumbled mess. What's surprising about this is that actually amidst that tangled, jumbled mess, it's not even uniform gas. You see different elements in different places. There's even like a jet coming out here. And do come on, come on, come on. If you look in different elements, you can kind of see that that jet is particularly strong in some, like silicon, and kind of weaker in others. There's a, like a silicon jet coming out, and then the iron is localized to a few places. So it's telling us about how the elements are distributed within the star. It's not uniform. It's a really complicated mess. And like I said, if you want to know how that complicated mass, mess works, ask Dr. Hasopoulos at the bar. He can tell you about complicated messes and supernovae. Uh, what it tells us is we can start mapping out where the elements in the universe come from. So Aaron told you about a periodic table. This is an astronomer's periodic table. It's color-coded not by stability like those nuclear physicists. It's color-coded by where things come from, ranging from mundane, you know, the Big Bang, about as mundane as it gets, right? Through to more and more exotic things. The things which are green come from the Big Bang. That's hydrogen, some of the helium, tiny bit of lithium, that's it. That's all the universe began with. Then other elements. Uh, when low mass stars die, they produce a bunch of elements down here. When massive stars, supernovae die, they produce these orange things. Those come from vaguely normal stars. When white dwarfs explode, you get the light blue things. 
One of the things that's been really cool the last few years is those nuclear physicists have told us we have to change our mind. Many people might have read an astronomy textbook, a supernovae produce all the heavy elements. How many people have been told that the gold jewelry you have comes from supernovae? Anyone? No, people are getting up to date now. Many of the textbooks, I think, still say that. It's probably wrong. We actually think that most of the gold comes from dark blue, merging neutron stars. When two neutron stars crash together, that produces an explosion called a kilonova. We actually saw one last year. The LIGO folks down here actually got to see one. We think that merging neutron stars make most of this stuff. Most of your gold, the platinum, a lot of your silver. Anything that's color-coded dark blue there probably came from two, excuse me, <laughs> probably came from two neutron stars smashing together. That wasn't in textbooks when I started teaching astronomy 1102. It's one of the neat things I love about astronomy is it keeps changing. When we sell you a new edition of a textbook, it's because the content's actually changed. It's different. Astronomy is constantly evolving. And that's where I finish here. And keep watching Extra Astronomy. We'll probably keep learning new things. You want that back? <laughs> Just for a moment. Fantastic. Fantastic, Rob. Uh, OK, so you got to tell me. you got to tell me. Who's making those fantastic animations of the Crab Nebula in the X-ray? Because those were beyond beautiful. Crab Nebula animations were made by the Chandra X-ray Observatory people. They've got a great press department. If you go to Chandra X-ray Observatory, look for our public pages. You can find images. You can find animations. You can find lots of cool news and exciting results. Great desktop backgrounds. Great place to look. Now, actually, something really exciting is uh, we've looked at some of these results from Chandra, and they make 3D models of the supernova remnants. And we've been working with the people at LSU at the Communication Across the Curriculum Department, and they have 3D printers. So we're trying to make some of these supernova remnants as uh, a 3D model for you guys to win as a raffle prize. So hopefully, we'll eventually be able to get that worked out, but it's, it's questions of like struts and stuff. So it's really uh, quite fantastic. So at this time, we would love to welcome questions from the audience about Rob Stock. Actually, can I just say one thing? Uh, did you make those files yourself? <laughs> I know the Chandra people have been giving those 3D prints away at conferences. I've seen those, so they do work. They've also got little keychains with a mini Chandra attached to them. I had one of those, but I lost it, unfortunately. Okay, elements in white. That's a really good question. I don't know. It's not on the key, so I don't know. <laughs> Um, there's only one of them, right? Oh, two. That would be a question for Aaron at the panel session later, maybe. Yeah, I actually don't know what the white is meant to be. Whether they're things that don't naturally occur in nature would be my guess, but hey, we got a bunch of nuclear physicists coming on the stage later, so they can probably answer that. One of the things I get to do as a professor is answer lots of time. I don't know, but I know somebody who does. It's kind of my job. Any questions I might know the answer to? <laughs> yeah. I thought you were a little sick. What is your field? I work on black holes and neutron stars, so I work on those X-ray binaries like Scorpius X1. That's my field. Yeah, no, I was trying to give a general talk. How does a black hole produce x-rays? Really good question, because everybody thinks, well, black holes are black, right? But what we see is not the black hole. It's all a con. We don't look at black holes. We look at these disks of stuff falling around black holes. We look at the stuff just before it goes into the black hole. Once it goes in, that's it. It's gone. We don't get any light. But just before it falls in, it gets really stressed out and gets really hot and excited. Kind of like you would if you fell into a black hole. You would get stressed out and excited too. Hopefully more excited than stressed out, but it happens to the gas. That's what heats the gas up to millions of degrees. It's the stress within that accretion disk. Same thing would tear your body apart long before you reach a black hole mostly. So don't do it. 
Yeah. So on the page that you had all the different pictures of the different compositions that we have to switch over, uh, I know that you had sulfur on there. Is that really the sulfur too at like the 670 nanometers? <sighs> These are all based on X-ray light. The question was, what is that sulfur to based on which emission line? These images are all based on X-ray emission lines. I do not recall which emission lines they used, but they're X-ray lines, not optical lines. Uh, the sulfur you're seeing here is probably much more highly ionized. Um, in many cases with iron, they're even looking at things like iron, 24, where there's only an electron or two left. Very highly ionized things. Yeah, right. The higher the ionization level, the less electrons you have left, the hotter the gas you need to produce them, so usually the further into x-rays you tend to see it. The, yeah, leave it at that. Can I explain what the blast wave is? That is probably the light from between the emission lines, what we call the continuum part of the spectrum. I don't recall the caption from these, but I think that's the continuum emission between individual lines. This is like the white light background. Okay, so here's the challenge. You guys have 30 seconds to find a connection between all of your fields, go. Look at stars, it's pretty obvious. <laughs> Weak. I mean, I'm leaving the stage, so it's up to you guys to pick your questions. <laughs> All right, so please, uh, if you had any questions that you didn't get a chance to ask during the talks, or any questions about how scientists feel about things in general, now's the time to welcome them. So again, thank you so much, uh, and I will join you after the panel. Well, thanks uh, for having us all. Um, I don't know why I have the microphone, but if anybody has questions about any of the science that we talked about or what it's like to do what we do or anything like that, please feel free to ask. We never did ask answer what those white elements were, the technician. Oh, I actually have an answer for that, Go so. Back. Um, those are elements, or at least the technetium, I, I would have to look up the other one because I don't know that off the top of my head, but those are elements that have no stable isotopes. So Aaron was talking about how there are various elements that are defined by the number of protons in the nucleus and then the isotopes are different neutrons. Most elements in that periodic table have some element or some isotope that's stable. Technetium does not have any, so they all will decay away, and as a result, there's none of that in our body because it would have decayed away before we were, you know, brought into existence. So. I don't want to hold the microphone anymore. <laughs> Questions, anybody? Over there. So when I said there's nothing within that sphere, uh, they were looking at other stars, not planets. Planets are kind of, they're a lot trickier to see because they don't give off any light. Um, and as far as I know, nobody's actually looked for planets, so hypothetically they could be there. So, yeah. He was asking about the nuclear waste question. Yeah? Common misconceptions about our field in general. Uh, so most of us here are nuclear physicists, and uh, we don't do bomb stuff. But <laughs> Catherine. Yeah, I would reiterate the not bomb stuff, because that's a very important point. Um, also, just general misconceptions about radiation, which you might have propagated this evening, I have to say. Um, most radiation, it, I mean, first of all, it's probably 
important for our evolution because we're being irradiated all the time by the sun and other things that come from the universe that make it down to Earth. And so a lot of, most radiation will not kill you. You do not want to eat any like radioactive sources. That's something that's very important. Um, but a, a lot, I mean, there's radiation in our everyday lives and I think there's a big general misconception of the, the population that radiation is a really bad thing, but in fact, it's really important. We eat bananas that have lots of potassium in them, and one of the isotopes of potassium is radioactive, so all of us are eating radioactive materials every day. Carbon-14, it helps us date things, um, and that exists in our bodies. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that's out there, so don't be afraid, be informed is the takeaway. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, okay, I, I guess I have to say something. Um, we're not all women? For me, <laughs> we are definitely not all women. <laughs> there are a few of us exceptions still holding out. Um, for me, it's black holes suck. Everyone says black holes suck. Black holes don't suck. Black holes are cool. But also, black holes don't suck. Black holes just have gravity. I always ask my classes, if you turn the sun into a black hole overnight, would we magically get sucked into the sun? Sorry, but no. We would just keep going round and round just like we were before. Gravity is just gravity. Black holes don't suck. Black holes aren't magic. Black holes are just gravity. Some people think gravity is cool, though. Uh, any other questions? How different would the landscape of research be if funding wasn't an issue? It's kind of hard to imagine. Um, there are certainly technical things that we don't know how to do yet. Um, and a certain amount, to some degree, funding those won't immediately solve them overnight. We still have to figure out how to actually make some things work. Some things certainly, yeah, we, missions that have been on the drawing board for decades could have actually flown by now if you pumped the money into them. Possibly we would do a whole lot better at publishing our data a bit more promptly if we could pay more of these wonderful graduate students. Um, but yeah, well, uh, science would be a really, really different place if we had a whole lot more funding. Um, but you know, so would a lot of things in the world be better if we had a lot more funding. Um, you always want to split the funding up appropriately. Science is important, but other things are important too. Uh, favorite celestial body. Um, I hate those kind of questions. <laughs> I love the black hole at the center of a galaxy. I, I think that is just so cool that we can see it. We can actually see stars orbiting around it. We can watch them move. There's one that we've seen go around and see a whole 15 year orbit of it. There's another one that zips in and gets really close to the black hole. When it's closest, it moves at 10,000 kilometers a second. There's a lot of crazy things down there in the center of a galaxy around the black hole. That, I, to me, is one of the coolest things. We started studying it really only properly in the last 20 years. And that's one of my highlights of the last 20 years, is we can actually study that in detail. There's even a plan to use radio telescopes to image the surface of a black hole and see the event horizon of a black hole and resolve it. So for me, that stuff's cool. I've got another one. Uh, has anybody here observed Saturn before in a telescope? Maybe at HRPO or somewhere in town. Okay, I see a few hands. That's awesome. Not enough. So one of the coolest things is that you can see Saturn and the other planets nearby exactly as you would see in pictures online. So if you Google Saturn, it's this beautiful crisp image of the planet and its rings against this black background. And when you actually look through a telescope, it looks just like that picture. It's pretty sweet. So go check out the Highland Road Park Observatory. You can look through their telescope. Any planet that's in the sky, they'll point it at that and give you a chance to look at it. And it can be astoundingly more crisp than you would imagine you could see with the naked eye looking through a telescope. Nice. 
kind of chip in a plug on that one. Sure. There is also a public viewing night at the Landolt Observatory on campus this coming Saturday. Look at the physics department website to find out what time, because it changes every month. But I'm sure they'll be looking at Saturn. 7.30 p.m. <laughs> Lando Observatory on top of physics building. Obviously, my favorite star is Shabilsky's star. I did a whole 20 minute spiel on it. <laughs> or the moon, because I'm a cancer. Yeah, I'm not sure how to respond to that. So, <laughs> other questions? I think I saw another hand up. Oh, my favorite celestial body is um, anyone that presents a good puzzle for nuclear physics, which is totally a cop out, but I'm going to own it. Um, by giving me the microphone, I don't talk to engineers, I don't work with equipment or instrumentation. Uh, for me, I work with a lot of software. I say what I want to be observed and how long and things like that, and then the data comes back. I have never built an instrument, I, I don't touch equipment, I probably shouldn't be trusted to touch equipment. These people actually build equipment. Um, so I, I think your question was probably in regards to telescopes and satellites and that kind of thing, um, which I cannot speak to because we're nuclear physicists, but a large part of what we do in our laboratories at LSU, like here on campus, is to build detectors to detect reaction products from the nuclear reactions that we're trying to recreate in the laboratory that actually happen in stars. And so we do a lot of that technological development like on campus in our labs at the like basement of Nicholson Hall, um, trying to figure out you know, new technologies and better ways to detect radiation and particles and that kind of stuff. Um, so that's a, a big part of what we do. And so a lot of our things are homemade, you know, that we take to laboratories and put you know, in front of accelerators and look at reactions. We don't buy things off the shelf. A lot of cases, we just make them in the lab and design them ourselves. So I, I don't know if that answers your questions, but. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Interesting question. Um, I mean, really nothing, I have to say. I, I mean, my... Well, it, it might be a cop out, but I mean, speaking from my own experience, I went to a, a you know very prototypical liberal arts college, um, had absolutely no nuclear physics experiment or experimental, you know, uh, background. Um, and when I went to graduate school, I was unsure of what I wanted to do. And other than having a bachelor's in physics and doing research in very different areas, I had no idea. And I met my advisor. He told me about his research. I thought it was really interesting. And I started doing nuclear physics. So I mean, a basic physics background, even one that you can get from a liberal arts education, which might not have like a million quantum mechanics courses and stuff, was plenty enough for me. And you know, kind of learn on the job training kind of stuff. So, I mean, things that are useful to have are certainly things that are useful to have for any, I think, physics subfield, which are things like programming skills, um, a love of learning. Uh, if you're going to be an experimentalist, just sort of general skills in the laboratory, how to solder and stuff like that. But I think, you know, most of what you need to know to do what we do. You can learn from your colleagues and from your advisor and from other grad students. So if you're interested, you should just go forth and pursue. Yeah, uh, I'm getting stuck again. Um, I'd add figure out what you like doing. Probably 
not just what you're interested in, but what do you enjoy doing? Do you like programming? Do you like experiments? Do you like working with equipment? Do you want to travel? Do you like equations? Because you can do all of those things in all the different fields, but having some idea of what skill set you want to develop is, I think, really important if you're thinking about going on to graduate school. What do you want to spend your time doing? Also, for going into astronomy, you are not going to, possibly unless you work for Tabby, um, you are not going to be going observing all the time and spending all your life at telescopes. I don't even travel, go to an observatory once a year anymore. And a lot of the data I get, I get remotely. I spend far, far, far more time in front of a computer than I do at a telescope or an observatory or anywhere really cool and exciting other than LSU's campus. It's not the glamorous image it used to have when Arlo Landolt was riding up the mountains on horseback. And yes, he did. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I'm a grad student. You don't need to know anything going in. <laughs> uh, as long as you're eager to learn uh, and you're dedicated, grad students like me will love you and teach you everything we know so we don't have to do the work ourselves. So if you're an undergrad and you're interested in research, hit us up. Nuclear physics, second floor, Nicholson. But <laughs> no, really, you just have to be interested in the field. And as long as you dedicate yourself to it, you'll be fine. And the only thing I'd add to that is that there's a lot of opportunities in the field. I've traveled a lot since joining it, and that's been a lot of fun to go meet new people in lots of different places abroad and in the U.S. And there's a lot of room to express your creativity and your smarts in learning more about the subject and maybe picking what you study.